Marie de France was born in Normandy, France. The exact city of her birth is not known, but it is believed that the area of Normandy in which she lived is about 50 miles outside of Paris. After her childhood, she moved to England, although the year of this is unknown as well. Even through Marie's last name is still a mystery. She is thought by some to have been the half-sister of King Henry II. She would have also kn known to Eleanor of Aquitaine, the woman we learned about in U7L6, thus granting her the opportunity to move to England. After her move to England, she presumably began to work on her writing and continued to create fables and myths until her death. Unfortunately, little is actually known about exactly where she lived or where and when she died. Although her actual name is now unknown, she is referred to as Marie de France after a line in one of her published works, which reads, Mary, um, I don't know French, okay, translated this means my name is Marie and I am from France. Therefore, she has become known simply as Marie de France, as her own last name is unknown. Marie de France is the first known female author to write in French. Her English connections are suggested because of the Anglo-Norman spellings in her earliest manuscripts. Marie de France is known as one of the most revolutionary writers of her time, as it was not common practice for women to author any text at all. Her fables are still studied as an example of what type of literature was being produced between the 12th century. Note, a fable is a story that teaches the reader a lesson or has a deeper meaning behind the story. Usually it involves animals, mythical creatures, or magic. Bisclar Vret. There is another Breton, refers to the people and culture of England, a tiny portion of western France and a tiny portion of northern Spain. Lay, poem. I must not omit a Bisclar Vret. The Normans gave him another name, Garoff, but the two are the same. It hasn't happened lately, but then, every once in a while, some men were transformed into werewolves and went into the forest where they spent their lives doing mischief. They would eat anybody they wanted to, they happened to meet. One who was affected that way, as you have guessed, was Bis Clavret. There was in Brittany long ago a baron, noble, with whom the world had no complaint. He was noble and handsome too. He advised his lord and was one of the few to whom he listened with great attention. The baron had, I ought to mention, a wife who was pretty and worthy as well. They loved each other, but I must tell you how every week he would go away and not return until the third day. Nobody had the foggiest guess about where he'd gone. This caused distress for the wife's mind. Although she knew that husbands don't have to answer to their wives, she said in the nicest way, My dear sweet love, can you not say where you go when you're not here? There is nothing in this world I fear more than your anger. But can you perhaps forgive me for my wifey lapse that arises from my concern for you? He was a good mood and drew her to him in an embrace. He kissed her and still was close to her face when he told her to ask whatever she liked, and if her question could be answered, he would enlighten her. With a sweet smile and almost a purr, she said, I am so upset without your presence here. Allay, eliminate my doubt and quiet my fear. I have to know what you do and where you go. Do you have a lover somewhere? That would be wrong of you and unfair. If it's something else, then put to rest the curiosity of my breast, heart. Have mercy, he said. Your inquiry can only bring great harm to me if I answer you, and I will be of no earthly good to you. I have that I may lose your love, and I, if that should happen, would surely die. This ought to have silenced her, but of course gave her curiosity, force, and urgency if it hadn't had before. She persisted and said, husband with his hat, and the sad husband, with his eyes downcast, replied to her question and at last told her that he sometimes became a werewolf. It was with some shame that he explained how, in the wood, he lived on whatever prey he could capture and kill. She digested this and then inquired of him what his costume was in these bizarre forays in attack. 
lady, werewolves are completely naked, was his reply. She laughed at this, I can't guess why, and asked him where he hid his clothes to make conversation, I suppose. Don't ask me that, I pray you. If I were somehow lose them, it would be a, my lot to remain a werewolf forever unless they were returned, and never walk this earth as a man again. This should have satisfied her, but when she heard him say this, she swore that she loved him and would internally. For him to keep secrets from her would show doubt on his part. I have no wrongs to you. You have no cause for any suspicion. And without pause, she continued in the vein, accusing, weddling, bullying, and abusing. Finally, he broke down and told her how near the wood there was an old chapel that has a bush close by. There is a broad flat stone that I have hollowed out in which I stored my clothing until I'm ready for my return. She was wide-eyed and appeared to have been satisfied, but she was alarmed and filled with fear to learn that her husband was a werewolf. How ghastly, horrible. How could she and such a creature have intimacy? How to get rid of him was her only question. The answer were clear enough. For her, there was a knight who had been paying her court and was quite ardent passion. She had never returned the passion with which he said he burned but she let him know that that could change if he were to help her to arrange a bit of mischief. She said, I offer you not only my love, but my body too, if you will do me a service. She, he agreed to this with alacrity, cheerfully. She told him about her husband and his hiding place for his clothes. At this, the knight immediately obeyed, and thus was Bisclaret betrayed by his faithless wife. Because he had vanished before, the court was sad but not surprised. They quartered the ground of the wood, but not a trace was found, and even his friends had to give up, having their lives to live. The knight married the lady he loved, and they lived happily. A year came and went, and one day the knight went out for the fun of hunting in the forest where Bisclaret had made his lair. The hounds picked up his distinctive scent and followed him wherever he went. They were about to leap and tear him to bits, but arriving there was the king, whom Bisclaret noticed. The werewolf ran up to his side, took hold of his stirrup, and kissed his shoes, which beasts in the woods often don't don't often do. The king was impressed, and he summoned his party to see what had given him such a start. He thought it was a strange and marveled aloud that the animal could be endowed with intelligence and could plead for its life. A beast that has such wits I will protect, and on those grounds I order that you restrain the hounds. The king, because it was late in the day, returned to the palace with Bliss Corvette following closely, afraid to even momentarily separate from his benefactor. The king became the beast the king, because the beast could distract and amuse, was delighted to have him there, and he ordered the, his kitchen staff to prepare whatever foods the wolf might eat. The animal seemed tamed, even sweet, and became a palace pet. It kept watch at night while his majesty slept. Is this the happy ending? Not quite. So, let me tell you what happened next. When the king held court and summoned his nobles of every sort to assemble before him to celebrate a festival, among these great peers of the land was the knight, you may recall. For the wife of Bisclaret had married him. He hadn't the least idea about the king's pet beast, but when he entered the palace hall, the wolf, with no hesitation at all, leapt on him and sank his jaws into his thigh. He had good cause, but no one knew what that might be. He might have killed him instantly, but the king spoke sharply and raised a stick as to beat him, which did the trick. Twice more during the day, the same kind of attack occurred. The blame, some said, was the wolf's, but others believed that the wolf itself might have been aggravated by the knight somehow, for none but he had aroused the wolf's ferocity. Back and forth the reasoning went in the good nature argument, and the king enjoyed it, although he tended toward those who excused what his animal friend did. Some time later, the king, on his way elsewhere, near the forest of Bisclaret, decided to rest for the night and found a convenient inn. Word went around of the royal visit. 
Miss Clarvette's spouse, dressed in her finest, left the house with a basket of elegant dainty sweets to bring to the inn, hoping to please the king. When Miss Clarvette saw her, he dashed towards her. He could not be restrained even by several men. He pounced upon the women and then bit her nose from off her face. There were guards and huntsmen all over the place about to kill the wolf, but a wise man told the king, no one denies the gentleness of the beast there must be some reason for what he has just done he has to have some kind of grudge against her and her husband judge his case as if you would that a man question the lady and see if you can find some reason for his rage the king heard the words of the mage wise man and ordered the man or woman to taken away and put onto the rack until she would say what she had done to provoke such hate as the wolf's behavior might demonstrate a shriek a whimper a plea a curse pain and the fear of even worse to make a stop she had to expose her pot plot and the night's theft of the clothes of this clavrette since which time he had not been seen the wolf was he she was certain the king demanded the clothes be fetched and they soon were handed to him who put them down before the wolf in a bundle on the floor but the animal seemed indifferent to his offering the wise man who had spoken before explained that it might be from embarrassment or fright he may not want to be seen as he transformed back to humanity put him in your room with this bundle and we shall learn what is the matter if he has privacy that may be enough we'll see the king took his advice and put the wolf in his bedroom the doors were shut two hours late later two barons and he entered the chamber quietly to find Miss Clarvette on his bed asleep. The king embraces him. They weep together in their joy. How grand. The king restores Miss Clarvette's land and gives him even more. The wife in the night he banishes for life. They depart and as one hears have children, but the girls she bears are born without noses on their faces. The outward sign of their disgraces. This is the truth and do not doubt it. The Bretons still tell tales about it.